So the Australian Food and Grocery Council, we're a, a, um, a council of all brand owners. Uh, a lot of people think we represent packaging companies and the retailers, we don't. We're very much all about... Um, Okay. Chip. All right. You got that up there yet? I'll let you do that. So we represent 140 um, brand owners. So they can be local companies, uh, small as and local as Birenberg Jam, Majura Tea, up to Unilever's, Coca Cola's, Nestle's. So we sort of represent the full bandwidth or the full breadth of the grocery sector. Um, Sorry, mate. No, what's going on? I, just a bit of background, I used to work, in, I've worked in the waste industry and in the grocery industry, so I've sort of worked around, when we talk circular economy, I came to this conference first time about three years ago, and it really struck me the similarity of all the, of the industries. Um, I didn't see a difference, it was just a different um, end of the supply chain. So that's what I want to talk to you about, is I guess the intention of the grocery manufacturers and where they're positioned and what they're doing. Um, to help facilitate and develop a circular economy. So while that's coming up, I'll go back to paper. Um, so three things I'm going to talk about today is, I guess, who's involved in developing a circular economy? So who are all the key stakeholders? Um, what's the process for developing the um, circular economy? And I'll give you some examples of what's already underway. So. A lot of people just say that a circular economy is basically going from and I've got it here, like four different stakeholders and turning it into a circle. This one is uh, considerably more complex um, because of the number of stakeholders that are involved. There's eight main stakeholder groups. So, and the, the pictures will come up soon, which they, will make they it will, a bit they easier. Will, yeah. <laughs> so, You're just on here. They're just not playing. If, if you can imagine a circle on the screen, <laughs> I, <can> do that. Um, <laughs> I had some good images yeah, too. Yeah. Wasted all that time. So, if, if you look at the at the start of it, you got the packaging companies. Then you got the brand owners who are a customer of the packaging companies. Then you've got the retailers who are a customer of the brand owners. Through to the consumer, through to the, the government, and all the different levels, MRFs and secondary processes, and back through to the packaging companies. I think we're nearly there. I think so. Um, this way. Come on. And, and I guess the key thing for me is having worked on what I'll call both sides of the circular economy, is there's a lot in common. And before we can develop a circular economy, we've got to get some understanding. I, one of the gentlemen on the panel this morning was talking about the need for understanding before action. So I'm a big believer in that. There's a lot of interdependencies inter, uh, at play here. One of the things we're conscious of is our members don't want to invest millions of dollars into a new packaging supply line when there's no infrastructure to process it. It's just false economies. Um, the, the other example would be we don't expect Vizzy to go and build a new recycling facility for plastics if our manufacturers trying to achieve the national packaging targets are going to move more into glass. So we've got to work together and get that whole sequencing right so that we're moving in the right order. Lucky I brought some, some examples. So, um, most of you would know that product. So, just talking through wh why packaging and, and what does it do? Like a lot of people would look at that and go, yep, baby powder, I know that. HDPE, fully recyclable. And then some clown at Johnson & Johnson's gone and put a plastic sticky label on the lid. The reason for that is, comes from the Therapeutic Goods Administration, and that's due to anthrax scares back in 2001. So there's a real health uh, connection with packaging. The, the next one I'll use as an example is Panadol. If you remember in Pan with Panadol, about 2001 again, some clown decided to extort money out of the manufacturer, poisoned Panadol, killed four people. So now there's um, tamper evidency tabs. So in this case, they're plastic on cardboard, which is problematic for a MRF. So as an industry, we've got to look after health and safety first, but we're doing everything we can to make things palpable um, so they can be recycled. So a couple of regulatory bodies that control that. So Food, food Standards Australia New Zealand. Oh, here we go. 
Yes. All right. <laughs> so that was that was my joke slide. That was that's the linear economy, and I'll let you assign um, industries to each individual. Uh, this was basically saying it's not that simple. So I'll just catch up. So the key thing today is talking about that, is knowing, getting our members as brand owners to understand what happens in a MRF. So I've started walking them through MRFs, walking them through chemical plastics processing facilities. Um, and I guess what I'm here today is to talk to the, the other side of the circular economy about what are the needs and what, what are the drivers and packaging. So going back to the complexity of it, eight key stakeholders, but lots of members. So we've got 140 members. Um, there's 530 LGAs, multiple waste companies, all have infrastructure, all have investments. So when we make change, we've got to do it in a, a coordinated fashion. So, yeah, this is a slide I was up to. So, uh, Fizans regulates food safety. So the primary role of packaging is food safety, um, quality and freshness. No one's going to buy a loaf of bread if it's stale. It's as simple as that. So. Um, that's why plastic is something, it's, an, it's almost like a necessary evil, but we're trying to work out ways of reducing it because we do understand the environmental footprint it has. Um, the medicinal, I've given the examples of the tamper evidency. The other thing we're involved with as the AFGC is we're involved with the National Food Waste Steering Committee and we're involved with the National Waste Policy. Both coming out of the Department of Environment, both good aims, but competing. So national waste policy is eliminating um, packaging. And if you're trying to reduce waste, uh, trying to reduce food waste, you need packaging. So we're now got this balancing act of how do we shift and at what time frame do we shift without impacting food waste? So you can see that graphically there. So that's sort of probably the key issue for our industry. Now, if you're like me and it's two o'clock and you're um, sort of suffering, I'll, I'll simplify this. Two things, I'm gonna pass around some chocolate so you can get some energy. But also, if you remember one thing today, why packaging? It's because you can't take your peas home in your pocket or your raspberries. You'll, you'll damage them in transport, you'll get poor food quality and you'll probably get sick. So that's, they're the primary roles of packaging. Now, these packs also will come with a question at the end. So, all right, how much time we got left? Any idea? <laughs> I'll just keep going. So I guess as an industry, the grocery industry, um, like, like the consumers, are really unaware, or not, not all of them, but largely unaware of the complexities faced by the waste industry. So we're, as an industry association, educating our members about MRFs. What have we got? Six. All right, I'll go quick. So they're the, the key things we know MRFs need and the recycling sector needs to increase recyclability, um, recycled content and to stimulate a circular economy. Oh, I oh know. <laughs> Wrong button. So I'll skip a few slides. So how, how do you develop a circular economy? This is the process we're working through at the moment. So if you go across the top line, the first step is to do material flow analysis, and that's the understand phase that I was talking about this morning. Knowing where your losses are, knowing where you're losing recycled content uh, to landfill. And if you look at that top, that material flow analysis has just been done by um, APCO, and it's just packaging. So about a 25% to a third of packaging doesn't even get to the yellow littered bin. So that's a, a primary thing we need to address. Uh, and the recovery rate's 56%, which is sort of in line with MSW. Um, then the next thing we need to do, I'll just go across the top line, we need to do a life cycle analysis to understand the carbon footprint of all the different packaging options. And then we can do a forecast of what material we're going to use over the next 10 years. Because if we're moving out of plastics into glass, you need the right infrastructure. With that information, we can do a gap analysis for, for government. So, uh, recovery rates for plastics and uh, for packaging, for those who haven't seen this from APCO, a bit hard to read, but um, paper and cardboard's at 72% for packaging, so really high. One area where the grocery industry is really good at, 
is, is circular economy. So cardboard packaging that goes around the consumer pack, so in a, in a carton, so it's secondary and tertiary packaging, straight from the packaging company through the brand owner through to the supermarket, straight back to Vizzy and Amcourt. No one sees it, but really high recovery rates. Another example of a circular economy is this one. I think a few people would know what that is. 100 years, that's been circular. It's yeast. So we've got members who are brewers. Their byproduct is an ingredient. So it's not a new concept for our industry. Um, so we've just got to commercialise it on packaging. The, the other one there, which is quite startling, is plastic. So there's a lot of noise about plastics. Plastics, the MSW recycling rate in the last National Waste Report, 12%. Packaging's 32%. It's three times the national average. It's, it's a good, bad story. <laughs> so whilst we've got a long way to go, it's a long way ahead of the national average. So um, glass is in line and metals have got some work to do. Now I've put this slide in for Gail. Is Gail here? Gail Sloan? No? If I hadn't put this in, she would have been upset. Um, this shows the grey bar. I have got a pointer here. The grey bar there shows the local usage. So whilst 32% of plastics are being recycled, only 14% is being reused in products. So that's the aim of our industry is to try and lift that. One of the things preventing that at the moment is it's all exported. So we can't buy what isn't made here. So we have to work through that and in consultation with APCO, that's why we're doing demand plans so infrastructure can be built. Um, no surprises about glass, 50% recycled, 36% um, is being used in local content. One of the big barriers, and I heard the comment from, um, from the floor during the, um, the panel about putting imports um, barriers or import taxes and things. One of the issues with glass is if you talk to the processors, in Australia the maximum content, recycled content, they can put in glass is about 25 to 30% due to the quality, the poor quality coming out of curbside. In, in markets like New Zealand, it's over double that. So the, the barrier to that one is not just saying, hey, manufacturers buy it, it's not available. So we have to get the stream cleaned up. So, and applaud councils like Yarra for, tr for trialling, pulling glass out and people taking plastics, um, paper out. If we can get the quality up, we can buy more material. Um, how, how am I going for time? Getting, getting tight. Um, the, the other one is energy usage. So when you go to the second part, which is the life cycle assessment, we can't just move from one pro pro product to another just because it's a problem that's somewhere along the supply chain. You've got to look at the environmental footprint of the product. And, and if you take into account a product um, that's manufactured, could be Vegemite, the total carbon footprint of that, only 10% of that is in the packaging. 90% of it is in the food manufacturing and in the agriculture to grow the product. So if you go to a substandard packaging format and you get food waste, you waste 90% of the product, of the energy usage. So you're actually doing environmental harm. So we, I guess the food industry can get a bit of a bad rap at times, but that's what we're working on with APCO and to try and um, understand this. That one just breaks it down to product category. Now, I don't expect you to read that. But that one there is meat. The energy to produce meat is that orange bar. The packaging for meat is the green bit. So a lot of people say, why do you put meat in plastic? <coughs> That's why. So if you take the plastic away and you put it in cheese cloth or you put it in something else, you're throwing away all that energy. So we've got some work to do. We're not walking away from it. But that's um, some of the things we have to take into account. The other thing is just the energy usage on the different packaging types to produce the packaging alone. This one comes from Cambridge Uni, and they're saying the energy to produce PE, so uh, in, is a HDPE, is the lowest energy uh, that and steel compared to glass and aluminium. So whilst we're going to try and hit the targets of recycled content and recyclability and reducing plastics, we've got to do it in the right, in the right places. So APCO is working on all of this, so they'll, they'll be doing all the life cycle analysis. And from that, this is where AFGC comes in. With our members, we can actually do a material forecast for now, five years' time in 2030. 
because if we know we're going to transition from glass to plastics, we need to forecast. It's a, it's a pretty core cool skill set of the grocery industry. If you're buying um, coffee beans, you need to buy them in season. You buy them a year or two out. So you put your orders in. So that's something we'll be working on. Um, then we're also working, um, working with WAMA and APCO on this one. So we're looking at the current infrastructure capacity. So then you, it's quite simple. One minus the other, you, you've got your infrastructure gap. So I know Carl was just talking about that, is what infrastructure is needed. So there's all the grants. Um, and so in some cases, you may need grants for uh, upgrading MRFs, if that's the solution. Others may be changing packaging lines. Others may be the actual packaging company innovating packaging. So a couple of examples, about three slides to go. Um, this is one Coke recently announced 100% recycled content by the end of the year. So, on that one. So all their small bottles by the end of the year will be 100% recycled content. So that's their commitment to a circular economy. They would do it on the bigger bottles, but structurally you can't do it because of the pressure of the bottle. So mandating targets, we get a bit nervous. <laughs> it's horses for courses. Um, and if you mandated 30% and Coke at 30%, they're at 50. So that they've stretched ahead of it. Whereas little Aussie company, Bundaberg, they're in glass. The maximum they can get is probably 25% because of the quality of curbside. So the solutions to these is to all work together. It's no one's pointing fingers, but if you gave them a 30% target and a tax, you're not going to achieve anything because it's just not available. Um, Unilever, another global company, they've just gone to, um, or they're installing a new production line. They're going to dual laid um, HDPE production line. So they will have virgin material on the inside and that's because it's got a chemical contact. They need to have certainty that then the bottles aren't going to explode or there's no weak, weak points. The outside will be recycled content. So that's, that's already underway. Um, Nestle, this one's a classic, Nestle has already banned all problematic plastics, so globally. So PVCs, polystyrene, EPS, and the list goes on, they've banned plastic straws. So the interesting thing from being in the grocery industry five years ago, going into waste and coming back, it's, it's, it's now literally a race to the top. They are, I'm getting calls from small companies saying, should I go to biodegradable packaging? Should I do this? Should I do that? So what we're doing is saying sort of hasten slowly, working with APCO, they're doing the due diligence. Once we've got that, we can all move as one and government knows where to put the money. The final one is, is Red Cycle. This is an industry owned um, stewardship program. So all of these companies put money in every year um, for products that are wrapped in all the films, so anything that can't go through a MRF is collected at the front of Coles, Woolworths and IGAs um, and that's processed by replast back into park chairs and bollards and all of that. The beauty of there, of what Red Cycle's done, is for Coles, Woolworths and IGAs to be allowed to have a bin, and I love saying this, allowed to have a bin, because Coles and Woolworths have a lot of power, um, they must buy back the same weight in materials that they generate. So, and how Coles got around that is they changed their procu internal procurement um, program or protocols that the little chair at the front of the store can no longer be timber, it must be made of recycled plastic. And they're using bump stops and all that. So that's, it's a pretty good example of a, of a circular economy. So I think that's about it for me, but probably if you can't remember anything else, it's just remember you can't carry your peas home in your pocket. That's probably the key point. Um, I'm not sure if there's time for questions. The only question I've got is for the drumstick eaters. <laughs> Did any of you, they're probably all spread out. If you notice on those, have you still got the packaging there? Yeah. Hazel, what have you got? If you look at the disc in the centre of that one, so if you can hold that up, Hazel, it's, that's a, a little plastic disc that sits in the top of the, of the drumstick. Who else had one? Some people would have had cardboard in theirs if they got eaten. There's also cardboard ones. 
Now the consumer rings Peters who make that and say, get rid of plastic, put in paper. The paper's coated in PE, can't be recycled, and also doesn't go through a trommel in a MRF and falls into glass. It's worse for the environment. The plastic is there also, it's got a safety seal built in. The reason there's two, the safety seal goes into your cabinets at your servos. So when Bob the Builder comes in to get his ice cream at the end of the day and he pours sawdust all through the cabinet, it doesn't get into the product. The other one is in a cardboard box in retail. So they're the things our members are struggling with. It's like, if I move to something more environmental, what does the community think? So we, we've got to balance all those things up. The other one is uh, the big tubs of lollies. Who's got that? So the tub at the back, totally recyclable. So Nestle implemented the Australian recycling logo across all 3,000 products. I started assessing them. That one should be 100% recyclable, failed. And it failed because of the dimension. It's too big to go through the trommels. So what that's driven is Nestle are now redesigning that tub and a heap of other products to make sure it's recyclable to suit MRFs. So as a global company with a global supply chain, that's very good. Um, and that's why I guess we're supportive of the ARL. It gives companies a, a baseline to, to target because you can't design a product for every MRF because they're all different. So they're now making those changes. So any, any questions?